this is, um, as, as you can kind of decode from the title, it's a talk going over not so much DevOps at all, but at a higher level, why people and organizations are motivated to do that and what they struggle with and what they succeed at when they're trying to transform how they're doing software. I'm sorry to throw a word like transform out at you all of a sudden there. But when they try to improve the way that they're doing software. Uh, and um, you know, it's largely based on conversations that I've had over the past many years. And the intent is to give you an idea of uh, if doing all this uh, wacky change stuff seems intimidating, it's you know, maybe not easy, but it's definitely possible. Uh, and uh, there's people probably like yourselves or not like yourselves, but all sorts of organizations are doing it and it's not a uh, impossible task. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is me, unless you can't tell. Uh, I work at Pivotal, um, and I work on, as, as I was telling someone this morning, I work on what we call the developer advocate team, but I neither talk to developers nor advocate for them. Um, and I'm more of the, uh, I guess you could say, management consultant uh, evangelist. So I talk to people in management areas and above, sometimes enterprise architects uh, and that type, um, which I guess, depending on them, they're a developer or not. Uh, and uh, it's mostly about what I was kind of talking about earlier is, is how does a large organization go about changing and what works out well for them and how do they even think about the higher levels of, of strategy and positioning themselves around that and how do they figure out the place that software has in, in the way that they're operating. Um, so I've been an analyst at a couple places at 451 Research and uh, Red Monk. I don't know, for about eight years or so. And I live in Austin, Texas, so we all down there have to serve a uh, compulsory two-year term at Dell. So I got that taken care of. Uh, I worked, at, interestingly enough, in corporate strategy and M&A, which is great. I don't know if there's any MBAs in the room, but it turns out they're not those people who would stick your head in the toilet in high school. They've, they've transformed. And they really know how to use Excel, and they'll teach you some fascinating stuff. But true, true, true story, they actually do drive red Porsche Carreras. So that's fun. Um, so I, I was a software developer, and I write a more or less monthly column and some extra stuff at the register if, if you can tolerate people who don't know how to spell color and virtualization uh, in print. Um, and I do several podcasts, and we, we actually got some stickers for one that I do, Software Defined Talk. Uh, they actually are die-cast, not square. I don't really know, is that, is that anti-aliasing or something? Um, but uh, I have some stickers if you want to come up and get them afterwards. That's not quite real uh, life size. Anyways, there's more uh, stuff you can track down my anatomy and inanity and, and prattling and all of that stuff. And of course, I'm, I'm up there in Twitter where, where we all shall live in, in the future, for better or worse. So as mentioned, uh, I talk a lot with organizations who want to improve how they're doing software. And oftentimes, uh, you sort of get this, uh, if, if the pivotal marketing and salespeople have been doing their job correctly, you get this sort of like enthusiasm from on high. Like, we're going to change how we do things and revolutionize it because we don't want, uh, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, whoever the big threat that uses computers is this year to come eat our lunch or dinner or breakfast or any sort of snack we might have, our 11Zs. Um, and, you know, so then if, if you're like uh, most people in the world, you're not sort of like the board of directors or, or as they like to call themselves, leadership, you, you get these kind of like change things passed down to you. And, and the one uh, that, that often comes up a lot nowadays is uh, digital transformation. Well, first of all, you know, if, if you want to fill your idle mind, it's fun to think about, well, what's analog transformation? That, that would be fun, too. Uh, but... Uh, you know, it's often like this situation. So you're, you're just there hanging out, playing with uh, Captain Picard, having a good time. And this strange, usually old, typically white, often bald, uh, depending on what side of the Atlantic you live in, good or bad teeth, uh, person comes. And they're like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to transform the way that you do work. We're going to update it. It's going to be awesome. You're going to be like Silicon Valley, whatever that means, uh, and all this stuff. And you're like, sure, this, this sounds great. I mean, I've got a few minutes here before, like, lunch and they're like all right and by this time you've got your hand in this box and like so what, what does this entail what's it going to do and they say well like I said it's going to be wonderful but probably like everyone before you you're going to die so let's get started uh, and so uh, that's kind of what it feels like a lot of the times when digital transformation is sort of uh, sprinkled down from above sort of uh, trickle down change theory uh, if you will so to that end I think to avoid uh, you know being inflamed and so you can to like sticking tubes up your nose and riding worms around. I think it's a good idea to have kind of like a chart based on uh, what other people have been up to to figure out what that means uh, to digitally transform. Now, 
I'm highly biased uh, on my interests and my background as a developer and because uh, you know, I work at Pivotal, that essentially, uh, if I had a longer version, I'd give you a better walk to this. But basically, your biggest bang for buck in doing digital transformation is to start thinking about how do we do custom written software that allows us to basically program our business, right? Like, it's one thing, like, if you don't have, like, uh, if you still got, uh, you know, your on-premise email, you should probably digitally transform up to hosted email instead of doing that. You got, so you got a few things that, like, you know, probably don't involve custom written software uh, to worry about. Um, you know, if, if you still struggle to attach something bigger than 20 megs to your email, then, you know, call us in six months and we'll work with you once you fix those basics. Um, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, if you're going to be digitally transforming and improving your organization, it's really your software process that you want to focus on. How do we become really good at software such that the business side, whatever that may be, whether you're in a uh, for-profit or a not-for-profit organization or government or whatever, the, the sort of people who are not you, not IT and not the, 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 nerd, the nerds, they come over and they say, like, I, I, I want to try this out by the end of the week. I got to change the business around to do this, this new feature. And then you're like, well, have you opened a ticket? Uh, and, and so you got you to figure out a better way of doing software uh, than that. And I think, so for, fundamentally, as sort of put here, uh, it's been my experience in following the software world. I don't know if this is a very good phrase. I just came up with this this morning. But like doing software really well is just like managing chaos on behalf of users. Chaos and unknownness, right? And this is kind of a fanciful uh, diagram. But you know what we've learned over the years is that when you start doing your software, it's extremely confusing. You have no idea what's going on. You don't even know if you're attacking the right problems, if the way you're solving it is correctly. You don't know if you should be using like a container or a VM or bare metal and what are all these funny name things. Like it's just nutty. And so you're continually exploring and figuring out what, what the right way to do something is at the end of the day, as we'll get into you, hopefully end up with some software. I mean, you know, number one uh, user story that's often forgotten is user would like software to work, so that's good. Uh, and, and the second one is like you would actually like to do something with it, right? You want to accomplish some goal that you have, which, which often gets uh, lost out in it. So, this is, this is my sort of like crutch of what a software process looks like, how you think about software and the discipline you apply to creating your custom written software. And, and think about you know, the, the vaunted and, and much demonized waterfall process uh, and the way where you more specify a huge amount of things up front, you work for another year to, uh, to, to work on it, QA it and write it, and then you probably, you know, you're going to fill out a ticket, hopefully correctly, the first five times, so you don't have to re redo it again. And then eventually you can deploy the software, and then like two or three years later, hopefully, you know, a meteor hasn't run into the earth and destroyed us all, and people can use your software. But instead, I think if you have, as I like to think of it, a small batch process, and the small is really important, because, I mean, really, it's, it's just a miniature waterfall, right? You do the same thing in any way that you're approaching software, but... You lean on a lot of, I like to use a lot of footnotes to show off how much I read. So uh, you can't click on those here, but if, if you uh, download these slides, you can go click on those things. But I think, I think the discipline process I see people using is this loop, right? Which is, I have an idea of, of something that's going on. I'm going to make a hypothesis of how to solve it. With software, how do we experiment or validate it? We write the code. That's the important part. And more importantly, we put it in front of end users and observe them and see if it solves their problem or not. This, this is the often forgotten did it work part. Very, very key. Um, and then the equally important part is like, if it didn't work, then we should try a new way of solving the problem. And if it did work, it's like, Merry Christmas, here's another problem to solve. Uh, so, so then you go around on that loop. Now, like I said, there's all sorts of things, you know, if, if you're into like figuring out how to get a high valuation so you can retire to Hawaii, there's the lean startup. And then there's the lean enterprise, you can get up to date on the Prussian army, things like that. Um, and then, of course, if, if uh, you, and maybe, maybe in this part of the country, uh, this is in more favor than it is in, in others, but you might remember the scientific method. Very nice system, that technology we came up with. But it's bit this basic same loop. And you see, applying this to uh, software, you get really good results. You get software that's very usable. And it's really that idea of being able to deploy on a, on a weekly or maybe a fortnightly basis, but on a very quick, a small batch basis that gives you this rapid feedback loop to improve the way you do software. So just briefly, uh, this is probably my favorite case uh, at the moment and for several years of, of a small batch process in, uh, in process, uh, small batch loop in process. Now, uh, if you live here, hopefully you're familiar with the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, the people who collect taxes. If you haven't heard that and you're a citizen here, you should probably look into that. That's, that's an important angle of how things operate around here. 
Um, you know, for the, for the rest of the world, if you've, if you've graciously flown in here, they collect your taxes. And you can imagine here in the US, we absolutely adore the IRS. We like, we like to give them lots of money, lots of leeway, all of that is not true. Um, so the IRS's budget gets reduced all the time. They're like blamed for every problem that we have, blah, 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 all sorts of things, right? Um, but so if you forget to pay your taxes, uh, and I don't know, maybe you're protesting or maybe you're just busy, you've got kids and other stuff going on, um, you're delinquent. And so what they do is they, uh, they have this great notification system where every year, you, and every day, not every year, you owe more money. It's kind of like the worst loan ever, right? Where it's compounded on a daily basis. So in theory, unless you're protesting, I guess, uh, in some cabin in the woods or wherever you might be. I think that was a New, New England jail, if I remember my obscure references. My friend back there probably remembers. But anyways, uh, so you want to you wanna find out how much you owe that day so you can pay it off that day so you don't owe mo more tomorrow. Maybe on Sunday they don't charge you. I haven't looked up the fine print. Um, so what they used to do is they would have a, a call center because they're a citizen of the world. That's what you do when, when you want to have your customers call you up and do, or find out something about you. Um, and the call center was, was not cool. First of all, you have to call someone. And I don't know about you, but like, uh, I don't want to call people, let alone the IRS, right? So this is another like, use case that they discovered latently, and purely accidentally, is there was a user story called people don't want to call the IRS. So they were like, ha, ah, how about if uh, we hang up on you uh, like 63% of the time? You just call in, and then we've satisfied the use case, done. Uh, which is a jokey way of saying that only 37% of, of the calls like got through. They would literally hang up on you the, the other time because they were over capacity. Um, and also, very expensive to run a call center because it involves humans, and I don't know about you, but I'm not cheap. Uh, so like, essentially, it's a bad situation. And you think about that from a, a business perspective, you've got this business process which is a failure, like an abject failure, right? If, if, if you're in a situation where you can work 37% of the time, I'm a really lazy person, you should try to recruit me, because that sounds like a wonderful work situation. Um, so someone had the bright idea, as often happens, of like, you know, computers are pretty good at this uh, sort of thing. Uh, so they were coming up with the process. Uh, you know, I used to work in online banking in the late 90s. It's easy to forget this, but like, it was amazing that you didn't have to go see a teller and you could pay bills online. So similarly, someone had this notion, and like a lot of technical people, they were probably like, oh, we got all the, I mean, they're accountants, which is a type of technicalness. We got all this information over on the before thing. So they put up this software and um, this version. And what we're going to do is like, just like in Facebook or in, in iOS, I don't know what they do in Android. I guess in Google Photos they do this too, but they're like, hey, would you like to relive your memories with the IRS? Every day we're, we're going to construct this full history of all the great times you've had with us. Um, and, and so they, they put this in front of users, and because they were following a small batch process, a very user-centric process, what they found out, and I've highlighted it in orange so you can cheat, uh, what they found out is people were like, I still don't know how much I owed, and they would want to pick up the phone, immediately destroying the whole effort of the project, right? Think about all the business cases and ROI and all that nonsense that you're forced to put up with people who don't like computers. Um, and you know, they found out that that didn't work, so they were able to iterate on very, a very fast feedback loop cycle. And what it, what it turns out, and it sounds ridiculous when you say it this way, but think about projects you've worked on and how ridiculous probably most insights you had were in hindsight, that it turns out when you want to know how much money you owe the IRS, all you want to know is how much money you owe the IRS. So you put that in front of people, and a lot, lot less people want to uh, call up, and then you know, usage goes up, and there's some impressive figures over there. And, and you really have a good application of having a very user-centric, enabled by a small batch process way of doing software. And you, know, you see similar things happening. I haven't updated this with all the, the wonderful, astounding feats of digital transformation from today. But you, know, you see similar things at regular, run-of-the-mill, gigantic, I guess, as well, companies. But, Companies who don't have the luxury of you know, all those startups who can change their culture every year, whatever that means, and you know, build their own stacks and things like that. Like These are regular people who arguably have equally, if not a bigger effect on our lives, but they get great results by applying this approach, this end goal, and everything underneath the, uh, the iceberg, so to speak, or the waterline uh, that, that implies doing it. So despite that, when a lot of people try to apply this, uh, this, this way, this situation, they, they, they kind of don't think about doing things the right way, they don't transition well. 
uh, maybe you know, they have problems with staff, whatever, but they end up with this situation, you know, a, a large, gigantic tire fire, which, which is a, a, a great everlasting metaphor of, of our industry and the, the thought lording business I'm in, but it is sort of this intractable situation largely caused by your own negligence, and you want to know how to uh, figure out how to get out of that. So to try to avoid that, let's, let's, maybe it's hard to like, put out a tire fire, at this, you know, they actually raised the referral bonus at Pivotal up to $5,000. So if you find yourself working at a tire fire, give me uh, an email, and we'll see what we can hook you up with. Um, uh, anyways, uh, so let's look at this kind of one, ti one, fire, one tire fire at a time, or let's look at the things organizations are doing to avoid that. So the first one is, so if software is key to the way your business is running, right, it's going to be the... There's no good words for this left anymore, thanks to marketing people, but the enabler, the thing that your, your organization is using to run and innovate uh, and do things with. Like, it's probably a good idea to see what the state of the art and accepted best practices of doing software are. I mean, just off the top of my head, you wanna do a good job at it. Um, and so, the first thing to check in on is at the team level, are we actually doing things in, in the best way possible? And you know, these are pivotal people, look at them, they're, they're, they're young folks writing on whiteboards and they're collaborating. They must be doing a good job. Uh, but in, in most organizations, and this is, uh, I think, the most recent like Gartner survey, one of the surveys they do about agile usage. And, and the first thing that's astonishing about this as we go over it is that people are this honest about how terrible they're doing. Um, I assume people don't lie about doing terribly, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they were telling the truth. Um, unless they were kind of like self-defeatist person, people who forgot to take their meds that day or week or whatever. Um, but, so you look at this, and basically it's asking their board of people, uh, like, what practices do you follow in Agile, and which ones are you planning to follow? So, the way that I would read this to fit into my narrative, which is basically what you do with charts, is more or less look at the, the blue one, right? And those are things in, in when surveyed in, I think, uh, October of 2016 that people were already doing. Now, if you're optimistic, you can add in the green, which is stuff they were planning on doing this year, which is code for things I'm not gonna do next year. Um, and so you look at the blue, and that's basically what people are saying that they're doing. And if you're not, first of all, if you're not familiar with these various agile practices, I mean, if you're at this conference, you probably are, uh, you should figure out what they are, because they're good. Uh, they're good ways of doing software, and it kind of gives you a laundry list. But you wanna go to all of your teams and kind of check in, no matter how many certified scrum masters you have, people often like to tell me how many thousands they have as if you know, they're just like, well, we're done here. Uh, but uh, go check in on the teams and see if they're following these practices. And chances are, as you can kind of see in, in this, these results, that they're not, right? Like, chances are very high that you're actually not following uh, many of the practices that are considered how you do software, not even excellently, but just so it's not terrible, right? And you know, Everyone does unit testing because that really works well. And like we all can write clicks or refactoring is cool. And then it just like drops off really fast from there. So check in on that. Make sure you're actually doing agile at the team level. Now another thing that comes up frequently is like people are, are trying to improve and doing agile and they still, uh, they still do a huge amount of upfront analysis. Like you might have heard the term water scrum fall or my favorite wagile fall, right? But they're really good at the team level of, of moving quickly and doing like a build every month. And, and do they call them golden builds anymore now that we don't have DVDs? I, I, I need to find out what the kids call that stuff nowadays, but maybe a platinum build. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, there's still, even though people might be doing really well at the team level, they do still do this huge amount of upfront analysis and specifying what's gonna go on. And you know, that's another tell that you're not actually doing things as well as you could be. You're not actually fully agile. And I, I, per the title of this talk, I don't really go into what DevOps is, but that's one of the great things that DevOps, I think, finally pushed into everyone's mind is that unless you pay attention to the full lifespan of your software, from thinking about it, developing it, testing it, deploying it and running it in production, your job's not done, right? So as, as a software person, as a developer, unless you're paying attention to everything, you're not really going to uh, uh, be like feeling good about yourself, hopefully. Uh, so that's why doing all this upfront analysis is sort of a bad sign because you know, you're just kind of giving up to like, I did my build and my job is done. But look for that as another tell of, of people who are screwing this, this stuff up. So then management, right? This is always a problem. But management is also like a good source of how you can be successful, which may be revelatory for people who have dealt with managers all their life. But you know, if you remember back to the, uh, the stick in your hand in the box, I mean, that's management coming to you. And if you're like, um, I guess me, 
not at my current company, of course, but uh, at, at many people, you're like, oh, great, this year we're going to do that thing. We're going to be independent and do the DevOps. That's wonderful. Had that go last year and the year before that when you immediately left to your uh, you know, annual kickoff meeting for North American sales management junk, right? Like you just sort of throw this stuff down at me and then you're going to come at me with another thing. And so, you know, management often gets this reaction. You're bringing them a great gift and they're like, no, that's a bunch of uh, poppycock, as, as they say. So it becomes very important right away for management to realize that they probably are uh, operating with a deficit of trust. And, and the reason that management becomes important, and you'll see this as we go through this, is it's one thing to have like one, two, three teams uh, operating in a very agile, cloud-native way. But you think about the scale of like a JP Morgan Chase that has somewhere between 19,000 and 30,000 developers, depending on who counted it any given day. And I don't know about you, but you probably need some management uh, in my mind to arrange all those 19,000 developers doing something. They can't just sort of self-actualize into awesomeness uh, at a team level. So management has to start with all the usual things of knowing what their strategy is, going over it, but they're going to have to apply a small batch process on their own to figure out how to set up incentives, how to reorganize, how to set up the team, and they're going to have to be experimenting just like we are at the software level. And so if you don't find that your management is doing this, one, if you're management, you, you should start doing that, thinking about how you're programming the organization. But again, if you see that your managers are not doing that, we're always hiring a Pivotal. You should email me. So, to that end, you, you start thinking about how are the organizations uh, set up? How do we arrange around doing things uh, this way? So uh, this, is, this is probably the most uh, popular thing that people ask me and other people at Pivotal in my sort of weird part of Pivotal uh, about how do we organize this, which I guess is sort of like, it's that, you remember that old joke about the drunk who's lost his keys and he's looking over at a light post and a police officer come by and says, hey, wh what's wrong? You're drunk. And he's like, oh, I lost my keys somewhere over there. And then the, the police guy says, uh, well, why are you looking over here? And the guy says, much better light over here. Uh, and so sort of like similar, like changing an organization is easy for management. There's really good light on that. But it is actually effective. Uh, it turns out the drunk did have the keys underneath the light post. Not to analogize management to drunk people, but they do have good expense accounts usually. Um, so the first thing that you see organizing, and I, and I borrowed this from a great talk that uh, Cornelia always does, um, is this is logically, maybe physically to use those terms, the shape of the organization, how you start to arrange things, right? So again, if you think of software as the most, maybe not most, but one of the core assets uh, that you have in your organization, you probably want to follow the best practices for how you organize people to work on it. And at the moment, like when you look in good software organizations whose primary product is software, and also organizations who have those astounding feats of digital transformation, you see that they do indeed have what we used to call DevOps teams. That, that's morphing a little bit. But you have these teams that have all the roles they need from the developers, the QA staff. If you're all security conscious and like compliance stuff, those people often are on the team in, in a long serving capacity. And designers and product managers, product managers and business analysts tend to kind of uh, pull together. But you see those people clustered on a team fully dedicated to their product, right? And they are the ones who are responsible for it end to end, and they build up the expertise of it, share knowledge amongst them, and that team structure tends to be uh, very effective for that. And then also, as, as, as we might uh, not get to, but you can imagine that uh, what we tend to see, again, sort of biased, is you have a platform that you're running everything on, right? Instead of having those 19,000 developers each be a full stack engineer, or whatever that is, and build out their entire stack down to the uh, HVAC systems, uh, instead, you have a centralized, standardized, maybe even homogenous uh, platform that everyone is running on that takes care of a lot of the operational concerns that you have and, and other issues so they can focus on uh, delighting the users. So let's look at what's, what's on these teams and, and kind of how they operate, just to give you a sense of that. So uh, first of all, on these teams, you tend to see a fair amount, uh, again, like they're fully dedicated to it. Uh, depending on, you know, there's a lot of debate over if they need to be able to smell each other or they can just use video conferencing. And I've always worked from home, so I'm highly biased to think that they can be wherever because, uh, you know, I don't want to have to drive through traffic to get somewhere. Um, but you do see people oftentimes very closely knit and working together, right? And there probably is an argument to be made that if they are uh, able to see each other and uh, smell each other, they're co-located, as they say, that that probably is better. But again, you know, traffic. 
Uh, and so, you know, you do see these teams following many of these practices, right? All the agile things that we were going over. And key to a lot of what they do is they work on this, this weekly cycle, sometimes even on a daily cycle if, if you get very lucky. Um, and another thing, feature that you see, you remember on the, uh, the chart that it's very rarely followed is they tend to do rotating uh, paired programming. And not only paired programming, but paired designing and paired product management. So they pair up with someone. And we could talk later on about how accountants get freaked out about that if they kind of do the crude math in their head. But by sharing this knowledge and working together, they tend to have huge productivity improvements. And the best productivity improvement that they tend to have is, uh, you know, back when I was a programmer, uh, I basically launched my second career by working about an hour and a half a day and then reading the internet and blogging about it uh, the rest of the day. So thanks to BMC Software for funding my career there. But it's really easy uh, if you're alone developing to get stuck doing research, right? Uh, looking things up. And versus if you're paired with someone, unless you've got some nefarious uh, sort of like pact with them, which is certainly possible, uh, you tend to stay on task. And just by staying on task, you end up working four or five, maybe even six hours a day which is astonishing, right? Uh, and think about the huge productivity gain you get by staying on task, sharing knowledge with each other, having more quality uh, by getting exposure to all parts of the system because you're rotating and collaborating with folks. Um, so I'll skip over that, even though it's funny. So you know, the, the, ne the next thing that you really need to look at, again, as I mentioned, is having a platform. And let's just say automating as much of your build pipeline, your deployment, all of this stuff as possible. And this is a little hard to read, but I think it's highly representative that when you, this is kind of like the Wagile Fall thing. When you ask development teams how frequently they deploy, uh, it's, it's you know, pretty fast. And then you go to the operations people and like, here's the way operations works is they tell me I need to keep the system up and running. So what I've learned is if I change nothing, it'll stay up and running. Uh, and that's basically the approach that operations people have. Because developers, as they're known to the entire rest of the organization, are the people who write the bugs. And so we want to contain them uh, definitely as, as much as possible. So there's all sorts of uh, things uh, that are included in a platform. But again, I would emphasize thinking about an end-to-end -end thing. What is every single thing we need from planning this out, developing it, running it, managing it, all the stuff that you need to actually get, get your, your product into your, your software into production. Now, this is from a white paper we did a while back. And if you look at this and you're like, hey, that's basically everything except uh, an ERP system uh, in, in, in computing, that's right. That's because if you're like writing and running your own software, you sort of need to make sure you've handled every single angle of it, right? Especially all of the operational, and, and I, I understand security is very popular nowadays, so you probably need that. Uh, but you, have, you need to think about how all this stuff integrates together and gets out of your way so that you can start deploying multiple times a day or just weekly, right? Think about not having to worry about all of this, this stuff as possible. Um, so, you know, please try my product. Moving on. <clears throat> so let's talk about scaling uh, this up, and then, and then we'll wrap up here. So uh, again, I, th I think this is with large organizations. This is the challenge they have is not understanding all of this or just getting a few teams to do it, but it's scaling it in the organization, expanding it. And, and I think this, the single most important thing uh, to start off with is, uh, if you saw my lightning talk last night, it's an application of the don't try theory, uh, which is don't be overly ambitious at first, right? So you're going to be reorganizing the way that you do things. You're going to be putting people probably on new teams. You're not going to be filing tickets and stuff. You're going to introduce new technologies, a new process for doing things. You might even have new people you haven't met before. So it's all crazy new stuff you have no experiment with. So if someone's like, I got a, an idea, let's rewrite the .com site and then tell people we'll be done in three months. Like that's probably a little too ambitious, right? So instead, what you see when you talk with organizations, and there's a couple of them cited down there, is they pick a series of real but relatively low risk projects to work on, or products, as we're supposed to say. So as an example, if you go talk with the, uh, the Home Depot folks, right, like some of the initial projects they chose uh, was the Pro Tool rental business, right, which has software in, in a store that runs that, and the Paint Desk, uh, which also has software running it. And, you know, they, they weren't totally satisfied with how that software was running. So the, and they're also small, yet they're real, right? That's not just a way to schedule a conference room or figure out uh, where to go to lunch or anything like that. Um, and so those were so things they could start working on that and learn, or as people like to say, fail, right? Uh, they could learn this new process, and slowly but surely they added more and more projects until you can 
kind of see uh, it's represented not exactly with apps, but it ramped up to a large number of applications. So start small and almost sort of skunk works or quarantine yourself so that you can, you can sort of fail and learn how to do this and learn the new process of doing things before you start expanding it out into the rest of the organization, which brings us to the other thing is you're going to need to start doing a lot of internal marketing. Like beyond those, like I'm sure you all get those email letters. Hopefully, maybe they don't need more, but at the bottom they always say like, think about the trees. Uh, so you've got those little email newsletters uh, that go out, and those are fine. But you actually will want to have internal events where you bring people in or use your, uh, your, your uh, video conferencing or things like that. But most of the large organizations that I see being successful at this, they immediately start thinking about how they're going to market this internally in the most scary, biggest meaning of that word. And they start running events on a quarterly basis to go out and market to themselves uh, how this is working and really convince the organization as a whole that they should be doing it. So... Uh, that's the, the little slice that I have at the moment. We, I, I put this, uh, well, I should say we, I just typed it. Uh, we put this book out last year. Uh, it's, I don't know why we didn't make it 50 pages. It's a crisp 49 pages. Uh, but it goes over in more depth several of the things I've talked about here. And I didn't go over like making fun of outsourcing and, and finance and, and things like that but, and dealing with legacy. But there, I, I think, if I don't say so myself, there's some good pointers in there to think about how to avoid tire fires and... Uh, you know, you have to lead gen yourself to get it, but you put that little plus thing in your Gmail address, and then you can just filter that crap out. Um, don't tell me when I said that. Uh, so uh, maybe there's uh, like 30 seconds or so for questions, or, or I'll be around to answer more. Or if you're like most people, I've left you uh, stupefied and ready to hear something different. So thanks for having me. <laughs>